Right, I've brought you here today to JCB Lakes. We're on the North Lake, which for those that don't know, it's predominantly carp. It's not what I'd call massively overstocked. The fish in here are absolutely mint, which is one of its main attractions to me. And there's some big fish too. There's a realistic chance of a 20 pounder. If that wasn't enough, the scenery is absolutely stunning. We've got JCB headquarters behind me. We've got flamingos in the water, not real ones, statues obviously. Islands, it's, it's a lake with loads of feature, loads of character. And today I'm gonna to run you through my session. The water's clear, it's still cold. It's not gonna be easy, but I think there's bites to be had. On the bait front, today we're going to be fishing the hybrid feeder. Now, the first question I have to ask myself is, ground bait or pellets? Unless I've got prior information that says to me ground bait's the best, then pellets are always a safe option, particularly this time of year. Water's still cold, it's clear. I just don't feel like carp in particular are going to be responding to ground bait. So pellet-wise, I've got a mixture of two pellets. I've got Ringer's Method Micros and Dynamite F1 Sweet. The reason I use two pellets is just to make mine a little bit different to everyone else. If I'm not having many casts, I want my bait to stand out, be nice and visual and lots of attraction. So, Ringer's Method Micros, the way I prepare them, this is something I get asked an awful lot on social media. You don't need loads of pellets for fishing, for cold water carping as I call it. So, I have a pint tub. So, a pint of Ringer's Method Micros. Drop them down there. Literally, third of a pint of the F1 Sweet. They're yellow, so a little bit, little bit of colour. I do believe when the water's clear, colour's really important. Just give them a mix around so the two are sort of blended together. And then soaking wise, I've got my own way of doing it. And what I say is this works perfectly for these pellets. If you're using different pellets, you might have to tweak it a little bit to get it to work for you. But soaking wise, cover the pellets. Obviously I've got the Guru strainer in there. Cover the pellets in cold water and I'll just start my watch and we're going to give that 90 seconds. 90 seconds for me is about perfect as in they're not going to be too wet. If they're too wet it's very difficult to bring pellets back whereas if they're too dry I'll have a little tub of water on my side tray and I'll just keep flicking a little bit of water in during the day just to keep them at the consistency I want. I will say here it's impossible for your pellets to stay perfect all day so that little tub of water on my tray is really really important. So they've been in 30 seconds while we're doing that, I'm going to just talk about the next step. Again, it's all about boosting your pellets in terms of attraction. And I'm a big fan of the Boilie Crush. Colour-wise, totally up to you. Uh, but all I'm going to do, three heaped catfalls of the Boilie Crush. Like I said, get it orange, yellow, pink. I just think it's really visual. So three heaped catfalls in there. These have been in, what, a minute 14 now. Just going to give them a little stir i we'll wait for that last 15 seconds and I'll show you what I'm going to do with that crush. Uh, it's important to keep mixing them a little bit just so the ones at the bottom don't get crushed. So moving up to, what, minute 28, 29, minute 30. So take the strainer out. Just allow the pellets to drain. So see the water, just give them a shake so that water that's trapped gets uh, released. What I don't want to do then is just leave them in the strainer on there because again, the ones at the bottom get crushed. So I'm just going to take my EVA tub tip them out into there, give them a shake, give them a mix round, and I'll leave them for probably like 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, give them another stir round, and after 30 minutes, they'll be perfect and you're ready to go. So crush wise, in Blue Peter fashion, I've got some pellets that I prepared earlier, because obviously they're gonna take half an hour, and I wanna show you exactly what I'm doing right now and get fishing as soon as possible. So they've been prepared, you can see, nice and spongy, mix of the two pellets, but I can give them another boost. I can give them a little bit more flavor. And the way I'm gonna do that, we've got the crush in the bait tub. Then we've got the sweet energy liquid. There's two things I like about this. One, it's sweet. I believe when the water's cold, the carp have got a really sweet tooth. So sweet, more attraction, more appeal to the carp. So I'm just gonna add, I'm basically gonna mix this crush to like a ground bait consistency. So the crush is a really good carrier 
for the flavour. You know I mean, the Kush has got a little bit of flavour itself, but not a lot. Whereas once I add the flavour to it, I'm enhancing my pellets in terms of visibility with the orange, but also a real big flavour boost, which when I'm not having many casts and trying to build a swim, I believe gets me more bites. So consistency wise, like I've just mixed it, probably put a little tiny bit more in than that. I'm trying to get it like ground bait basically, uh, so it's not dry. I don't want to turn it into a slop so it's going to ruin my pellets but just get it into like a ground bait consistency so when you squeeze it like that it just stays in the ball so three catfalls so you're pinting a bit of pellets tipping it in with my the pellets i prepared earlier and then just mix it round just give it a good mix it actually helps the pellets bind as well so if you're having trouble getting your pellets to stick around the feeder adding a little bit of crush just gives them a bit more binding power as well just make sure it's all mixed in thoroughly. So by adding that crush, I've just given the pellets a lot more attraction, both visibility-wise with the orange flakes and also flavour-wise with the sweet energy liquid. So you can just see there, plenty of fish pulling power. So there you go, the pellets are done. Nice and simple, but everything's done for a reason. And that reason is to get that extra few bites, which can make all the difference. Without doubt, the most important cast of the day is your first cast. Because if you get your first cast right when you're fishing venues like this, the rest of your match or session becomes a lot easier. That first cast is really important to be on the right distance. So we're starting at 64 metres, as I've said. Feeder choice, I think it's going to be a patient day. It's cold, the water's clear. I don't think lots of casting and putting lots of bait is going to do me any good. So it's a case every cast needs to count. Feeder choice, 45 gram large hybrid. I could perhaps get there with a 28 large, and I do love the 28, but I want to make casting easy. I don't want to be having like a couple of missed chucks. Every missed chuck in my mind when the weather's like this and conditions like this, I could be spooking fish. So 45 gram large hybrid, four inch hook length of 019 N gauge, size 10 QM1 hook, little bayonet on a loop so the wafter can pivot. I've got my little tub of water here for wetting my pellets. Also just checking my hook bait sitting right. What I'm looking for is hook down, waft her up. So that's all sitting good. Loading the feeder. I'm thinking this first cast, as I said, I don't want loads of casts. I think loads of casts is going to be a recipe for disaster. And I mean, some people will be saying, oh, he's got the whole lake to himself, it's going to be easy. Which in the summer, I would agree with that. But with it being so cold today, there's a chance, if I mess things up, I'm going to push the fish out of range and I'm really going to struggle. So. This first cast needs to be on the money. I'm going to probably fish it for half an hour, obviously, unless I get a bite. So loading the hybrid, first layer on. I'm going to put it on with a little bit more pressure than normal because I want to guarantee that even after sort of 25, 26 minutes, there's still some pellets on the feeder. Wafter on top, like the cherry on the cake. Just a few pellets on top of that. Bit of pressure. Little tip and something that I do, if you're worried about whether your pellets are working right again the tub of water you can do so much with it I just, I just make a little ball of pellets drop them in the tub of water and just watch how they break down as a guide i want them to start breaking down in literally like five seconds you know these are absolutely perfect but if you're worried about how your pellets are breaking down that little tub of water is a great way of testing them so feeders loaded now it's a case of putting it on the money and waiting for a bite I reckon it's about seven, eight foot there. Might be totally wrong, because I'm not an expert on it. But judging by the drop, I'd say seven or eight foot. You know, I'm not going to sink the line. You see some people now would submerge the rod and give it a bit of a strike. That feeder for me can't move. So I need that feeder basically to stay there. Pellets is now starting to break down. Hook baits there, Everything, the trap's set, so to speak. I always think like by people putting the rod under the water and striking, there's a chance they're going to move the feeder. So now what I'm getting is a little bit of a bow. So because I don't want the feeder to move, all I'll do is just pick the bow up like that, and just straighten it, and just literally let the line sink itself. If a fish picks up the bait, I'm either going to get a big drop back, like so, or a massive pull round. So bite detection is not a problem. It's just a case of ensuring that feeder doesn't move. So once I'm happy, the feeder's not going to move, the line's sinking, 
case you're just starting the watch. You know what I mean? For this type of fishing, a stopwatch is literally invaluable because I need to sort of, the way I break it down, like today, I might be fishing for like four or five bites. I don't need 40, 50 casts to catch four fish. I, in reality, I need four casts. And I'm a big believer in the harder the fishing, the longer your feeder's been in the water, the more chance you've got of getting a bite. So it's a case of basically putting the, setting your trap in where, you, where I believe is the most likely position to catch one first cast and then wait it. I mean, in the summer as well, I would have several different feeders on the go, but this time of year, it's not one for what I call experimenting. So it's literally a case, I've got one other feeder set up exactly the same. I'm gonna put a 10 mil pink slim wafter on it, purely on the basis that's what I've got on at the minute. I'm a confidence angler, so the way I look at things is, if I get one on that pink, if I get one on the pink that's out there now, my next chuck's on pink. If I don't get one on pink, I might look at yellow for the second chuck, but at the minute, just to save a little bit of time, I've put a pink on there with the idea being, I'm gonna get a bite first chuck, and I'm gonna go with my number one option all the time. When you're only fishing for literally, might be less than a handful of bites, it's important to stay warm. That's where the trusty flask comes in. And the other thing is, it's almost like the fish are watching. The amount of times I need a bite, just go to pour yourself a coffee and round goes the tip. It's not worked to be fair on the first cast, but it's definitely one to try late on in a session if you're desperate for a bite. Well, we are just over 25 minutes into cast one. I've had no signs. Uh, something else that's important, I always believe in winter, particularly on venues like this, keep your eyes on the water. A, a topping fish can be like a massive clue as to where they are. This morning when we first got here, we did see a fish, sort of, probably like 25 degrees further right than I've made that first cast. And probably 10 minutes ago, the water went a little bit flat. And something moved in the flat water. There was a grebe, I'm not 100% sure it was a carp but at the minute it's the only thing I've got to go on. What I will say is, with no, I'm not looking to build a swim. So having not had a bite at the minute, unless this goes around in the next minute, as far as I'm concerned, that particular line, that particular distance is done. I won't go back. Unless I've had indications of a bite, I won't go back to the same spot again. So what I'm thinking now, I've got two options really. I either take a little bit of line off, and go a little bit further, two, three, four metres further, so I'm just so I'm in fresh water, or I change the angle. And when I say change the angle, I'm talking about rather than, because one of the beauties of this peg is you've got a lot of options. Obviously the island is in front of me, there's a little island to the right, got a bit of open water to the left. Even in a match situation, it gives you a lot of water. What I'm thinking is the two fish we've seen have been right of where I'm chucking, so my gut instinct at the minute is, give this another 30 seconds. I'll be honest and say I'm not feeling it, this chuck at the minute. I'm gonna stay on the same 64 meter clip, but angle it to the right in that sort of area. There was a bit of calm water, and I think sometimes calm water can be warmer when it's this cold, but I'm thinking angle it to the right into new water. The important thing is for my next chuck, as far as I'm concerned is, new water so i'm going to make a change obviously i'm on pink pink's failed me miserably oh i've just knocked the tub over so i'm going to switch to a yellow water's nice and clear yellow's a good color worth a try so i'm going to put a yellow on just to save a little bit of time just check the hook bait that's sitting it's a little bit buoyant that one to be fair that's why i always check them just to make sure they're sitting right I will trim them a little bit if they're too buoyant. What I don't want is the hook hovering off bottom. And that one's hovering as well. So I'm just gonna trim a little tiny bit. It's just a yellow 10 mil slim. Just gonna trim a bit off the end. Good thing when you trim them, that's bad. Hook, hook line flat wafter up. So I'm just gonna make the ball up so I can just literally reel it in and cast it straight back out. Get that in the optimum position. Going with a relatively skinny ball on the basis, I'm, I'm looking, 
I'm not trying to feed the fish as such. I'm just trying to set a trap, catch a fish, and then hopefully catch another one after that. So chuck one, as they say, is done. But if I had a limited corridor of water, then I would go further. But because I've got angles to work, I'm loath to go too far too soon. It could be, it's just going to, it is going to be hard because the water's like ice. It could just be like just fishing for one or two bites and it might be I have to leave it out a bit longer to get them. But I'd rather do that a bit later in the session. At the minute, I'm still trying to find the fish. So that's in totally new water now. Although I'm on the same distance, just because of what the peg offers, I'm probably, I don't know, in 64 metres there, I'm probably 25 metres apart. So that doesn't sound a lot, but if the fish are sitting there and not there, 25 metres is a lot of water for them to cover. So we'll reset the watch, start it again. I'm going to stick to half an hour. You know, I, mean, I will go later on if we're really struggling and then we haven't had a bite, I'll go 45 minutes, but I'd rather do that when I'm further out. I do think the further out we go, the better. That's why getting your starting line right is so important. It might be I've started slightly too short. I've had no liners, which I didn't expect. So I can't say, oh, I've gone over the top of them. Uh, and it might be I need to go another 10 meters, but I want to cover the two main options in front of me first. So another half an hour on this, then we'll be an hour in and I can reevaluate. Tackle wise, I've opted for two rods, nice and simple. Firstly, 12 foot Aventus distance feeder. I'm looking at two distances, but that doesn't mean I'm gonna bait two distances, but I'll talk to you about the actual tactics once we're on the box. So 12 foot distance feeder, this is clipped up at 64 meters from a starting line. That for me is far enough out to catch a fish early, hopefully, but not so far that I'm gonna risk pushing the fish out the boundaries of my swim. So 12 foot distance feeder, two ounce tip, uh, Reels TDR distance, loaded with five pound pulse. I love pulse for the fact low diameter, flows through the rings nice and smooth, makes distance casting easy. But I don't want to be casting straight off five pound pulse. So 12 pound leader, shield, shot leader lengthwise. It's another question I get asked a lot. I've gone for quite long leaders today because I know there's a few rocks in the water and I want that little bit of protection from a main line once I get fish under my feet. So when I'm, as a guide, when I'm in the casting position, I've got sort of eight turns of the leader on the reel. So that, that gives you a sort of an idea of length rather than me giving you arm's length. So 12 foot distance feeder to start, 64 meters, but the fish might move out. I think with the water being clear, it's cold, I think the fish are gonna move. So I've clipped up a 13 foot Aventus distance feeder at 80 meters. I won't move straight from 64 to 80, but if I wanna go 80 plus, that's where the 13 foot's gonna come in. Everything else is pretty much the same. The only change is I've put a three ounce tip in purely for the distance. The rod just corrects itself a little bit quicker with a stiffer tip, makes casting that little bit easier. And having casting easy is really important with this sort of fishing. It just goes to show how important new water is. That first chuck, I think was definitely in the wrong spot because that's only been out nine minutes on the second shot. I actually don't think it's a massive fish, but it just shows 64 meters wasn't a bad line. It's not a big fish to be fair, unless it's a bream, but it was a proper pull. I don't think 64 meters was the wrong distance, just the wrong spot. Uh, and it just shows how once you do find a few fish, you tend to get a, a much faster response. I think they've put some like quite small, well, not small by, JCB standards fishing here. Because it just doesn't feel, I was expecting like a, a 10 pound fish. This feels like four or five pound max, maybe not even that, but it's a bite. And that's the important fact. Here we come, we're gonna see it, unless it's a bream. I don't think it's, a, surely it's fought a little bit too hard to be a bream. That's a little, it's a really small, a really small JCB cut, but as I keep saying, we are off the mark.
So, having got off the mark, I'm a big believer if you catch a fish, you go back to the same spot. The reason being, I just think where there's one carp, there's always a chance of another one. So, I'm going to load that back up, sticking with the yellow, because I've had a bite on it, and like I say, confidence is key. Skinny ball. And I'm going to go back, obviously on the same clip, to that same area, because nine minutes is a pretty quick bite in the cold. went in lovely. It's quite shallow there. It almost feels like it shallows up a little bit there. It's really important, I will say then, I said that went in lovely. For me, it has to go in with like that plop. So I know I've not like, if it goes in like, it's terrible noise, this skadoosh, you can knock all your bait off. I need to know that, that if that feeder goes in with a nice plop, so it sounds as though it's gone in quite hard, I know that the pellets are all intact, feeders hitting the bottom, and that little trap set perfectly. So, restart that watch. Let's see if we can make it two, and hopefully, the next one will be a little bit bigger. Although, when it's cold, every bite's a bonus, as they say. Well, I went back to the same spot, I've been at that little common. Basically, it's been there now. Best part of 30 minutes, I had, to add a tiny indication on about 12 minutes. Not like a proper liner, just like, almost like a half inch slow pull and just, as though something just brushed a line, but it could be, a, there is some bream in here. Could have been anything really, but nothing's developed. And I'll be brutally honest with you, I'm, I'm loath to go back to the same spot. So I always believe if you don't get one in this spot, you need to move, so what I'm gonna do I'm going to move and go a bit further. So I'm going to peel off. I always take it as from the lip of the spool to the ring is about 50 centimetres. So that's a metre, two metres, two and a half, three, three and a half, four. I'm going to move four metres, put the clip back on. Important to remember to do that. Wouldn't be the first time I hadn't. Just wind up that slack. And I'm also going to split the angles because there's a couple of lads fishing, you probably can't see them on camera through the gap. And like, part of me feels they're gonna push fish my way a little bit. I can't see where they're chucking. Uh, so I'm gonna split between like where I caught the fish and where I started, sort of go down the middle there. So I've got another four meters, so I'm in fresh water, a little bit further out as well. I just think it's really important when you're not catching, fresh waters like can make all the difference. Skinny ball. Ducks are still chatting. So I'm going to sort of go in between, caught, started there, caught the fish there. I'm going to go right through the middle of that, of them two spots now. Just some work in the swim. It's lovely, you know, I mean, you'd say that was in light, perfect water. I'm just going to peel another metre off as well. So next chuck, even if I get one, I just move a little bit, so I'm a little bit further out in case the fish is sort of stacked up behind the back of that island. Start the watch. And again, I'm not sinking the line. It's difficult at the minute, as in, this is a big chuck for me, I feel, because timing-wise, my one bite's nine minutes, so if I don't, this chuck, I'm gonna sort of play it a little bit by ear how long I leave it out and then reevaluate. It's getting to the stage where I feel like it's going to be maybe even harder than a four, and I might need a 45 minute chuck to try and trick one, but I'll make that decision when I need to. Oh. Feels a bigger fish as well. It's pulling back for a start, and that's. First fish was nine minutes, second fish, nine minutes. So I'm already starting to get a pattern which enables me to fish a little bit more effectively as well. It could be that there's not gonna be any mileage in leaving it half an hour. It's gonna be a case of trying to find a fish, drop on it and maybe 20 minute chucks. I can fish more effectively once I've had a couple of bites. I don't believe it's coincidence that I've had two bites, both at nine minutes, although I've spilt my coffee everywhere, I've just noticed. But the, co the coffee trick, Never fails. 
doesn't feel huge, but it's definitely bigger than that first fish. It's just kiting across to the right. Like I say, I just think that's a real good evidence, proof if you want it, of how important that new water is. When the water's cold, it's, it's totally different in the summer. In the summer, I'd have picked a spot, been quite aggressive, and waited for the fish to find the bait. But when the water's as cold, my feet are absolutely freezing. As cold as this, there's not many anglers on. Those fish just don't really want to feed. They won't come to bait as such, but if you can put a bait near one, then often it'll pick it up. Hard to tell how big it is. If I was a betting man, I'd say it's seven, eight pound maybe, but it could be bigger could be smaller as well but it's definitely bigger than that first common again on the yellow as well just that trim down yellow slim I say it might not make any difference to hook bait color but for me it's confidence it's just kited up that channel a little bit one thing about playing fish as well when you're only looking for like four or five bites you don't need to rush them just heard that leader hit the ring. As soon as I get that leader on, I've got a couple of turns on now. It's not far off netting position. I think it wasn't far out with my estimate, actually. Maybe a little bit over. Another common. See how clear that water is? That's another reason why I think they spook so easily. They always fight hard. Not fish like this late loads, but one thing I've always found is, particularly the big fish, they do fight. I think because the water's clear, they fight their weight. It's just gone a bit scatty now around the net. Always great looking fish as well. I just want to make sure they end in the net. This one's got a proper second wind. Here we go, he's coming up. Oh, it's a nice fish, actually. So I just think it's that clear water that makes them hard to catch at times. Another reason why I think colour's so important with your bait, like that little bit of orange crush, a bit more visibility, a bit more smell, increases your chances of the fish finding it. I'm making a right meal of this. Here we go, he's gonna pop now, he's gonna come. Here we go, there we go, he's in the net. Another really important aspect of this type of fishing is hook bait choice. Now, I sort of narrow it down into sort of two camps. First of all, size. Eight or 10 mil for me when I'm fishing for big carp. I just think bigger bait. Carp have massive mouths. Even a three pounder is gonna suck in a 10 mil uh, waft at no problem at all. So first thing, size, eight to 10 mil. Then we're looking at shape. There's two shapes I use. Bandom, that's in the sort of barrel shape or the new slim shape. The slim shape, I've caught an awful lot of fish on this winter, mainly because I like to have something different. Like before these were released, I was privy to be using them. And I just think some, giving something, the carp something that they don't see all the time just gives you a little bit of an edge. And I think maybe the shape they find a little bit harder to deal with and you get more bites as a result. So that's the two shapes. Colour wise, this winter, fluoro pink has caught me basically, I'd say 95% of my carp. Uh, the main reason being, I tend to start on it because it's been catching me fish. I've been getting early fish on it, and if that happens, I won't change. So, fluoro pink has been a banker for me. If you're in doubt and you turn up to a venue, you don't know what colour to use. If the water's coloured, fluoro pink and fluoro orange offer really strong silhouettes, and they'd always be my sort of starting point if I didn't have any sort of prior knowledge. But if the water's clear, fluoro yellow takes a lot of beating. I just think it's a great standout bait. Or if the venue you fish. If sweet corn's a good bait on a venue, maybe they do a lot of pole fishing, feed a lot of corn. I've always found fluoro yellow, looks a bit like corn, catches me a lot of fish. And last but sort of not least, the washouts. 
A lot of people sort of sneer at washouts, or oh, they're not very bright, they're not very vivid, but that's the idea with them. The idea is they sort of blend into the ground bait more. And when the fishing's really, really hard and the water's clear in winter, I catch a lot of fish on washed out yellow in particular. So that's the colours, that's the sizes, and then it's all down to confidence. There's another comment, that's a bigger one. You can see the yellow wafter right in the bottom lip, and he's in the net. That's definitely the biggest fish. I don't think that's far off. That's probably not far off double figures. An absolutely mint fish. Great big hoover mouth. And proof if you needed it. You can get bites in the cold just by playing the percentages, moving around and getting your timings right. So I'm going to pop him in the net and if they keep getting bigger like this, I'm going to be really happy. This cast's been out 25 minutes and it's not gone. So, and I feel like the bites have been quick. I don't really want to leave it any longer. I'm sort of happy with distance. What I'm going to do is just change the angle again now. I'm going to come away from the island a little bit just to see if the fish have moved left. The conditions have changed as well. As in, wind's now in my face and the temperature, it was cold before, but it feels even colder now. A little word before I cast and while I'm casting, just on casting, this style of fishing relies on making every cast count. So a couple of little tips. Firstly, if you're using a hybrid feeder, the long stem. If there's a crosswind like we've got today, it just helps the feeder cut through that crosswind more accurate and in turn more distance. The other thing is the right drop. I like to cast off a, a, what I'd call probably just above half the rod. That way I can, I can compress more of the rod. If you wind it too tight to the tip, you're only compressing a little bit of the rod. So a nice long drop. And the other key bit of advice is hand speed. I'm right-handed, so I create all the speed for the rod with my left hand. So let's get this back out there and I'm gonna just go a little bit left where I've been going. Hit that clip nice and hard, that lovely little plop. But the rod speed, just because I'm holding the rod with my right, doesn't mean that's the one that's creating the speed. Everything's coming with my left. Pulling really hard on the bottom of the rod, create that speed, get the accuracy, get the distance. All right, the temperature's really dropped. I'm going to make this the last fish of the day because my hands are absolutely freezing. It's been a really good session to be fair considering how cold it is. The big fish haven't fed to be honest but that's something that happens a lot at Boddington as well. When there's a quick temperature change then bigger fish go off and it's been a real good illustration of fresh water how important that is and changing the angle. Sometimes you don't need to go further, you just need to change the angle to get a bite. And I think that's one of the most important lessons is changing the angle, because it means you've got more moves then as well. It's a nice chunky, tell you what, they're great looking fish. Nice chunky common, if he comes in the net, to finish on. An absolutely immaculate, like I said, I've not managed one of the JCB big ones, but I could save that for another day. But if you can catch a better looking carp than that one to finish, then I've not seen it. Great way to end the session. 
I'm going to get packed up and defrost those fingers. <laughs> 